America, Refugee Dreams, Refugee Nightmares, from KUHT Houston, date January 27, 1988. Producer, Ginger Casey, running time 5757, including tag at end, recorded in Dolby A. The refugee cries in gas despair. But sometimes you have a dream or nightmare in which you try to reach for something and, and it keeps evading you by being just a little further away, one or two feet further away from your reach. This is the feeling that we all had when we first came here. And lost the country. And lost the entire country. Since the fall of Saigon in 1975, America has experienced its largest modern day influx of immigrants. Some 700,000 people fled Southeast Asia, some by boat, some on foot, to come to the free countries of the world. Most came to America, the country that tried to defend their country. This was their promised land. By 1980, 14,000 Vietnamese were arriving in the United States every month. Many knew no English. Most arrived with the clothes on their back and a small satchel of belongings. The door seemed wide open back then. While the Orange County, California area had the largest settlement of Vietnamese, Houston, Texas was right behind. Some say it was the hot and humid climate of the Texas Gulf Coast that reminded the refugees of home. Others speculate it was Texas's booming economy. Oil was $30 a barrel, and Houston was a place where nearly everyone could find a job and cheap housing. But Texas's good times didn't last forever. The oil industry collapsed. Tens of thousands lost jobs. Banks went belly up, and Houston became the foreclosure capital of the country. The issues of resettlement exploded. Resources already strained struggled to accommodate the growing needs of refugees, refugees who were markedly different from most of us. All of a sudden, people aren't coming from where the rest of us came from, and, uh, and, and that's been a major shift. Between 1820 and 1960, 86% of all immigrants to this country came from Europe. Between 1970 and 1980, only 18% came from Europe. There's been this tremendous expansion of Latin American and Hispanic uh, communities and Asians. Tensions flared along the coastal fishing communities, Asian gangs stymied police, and in many areas, the welcome mat wasn't out anymore. White supremacy! You bet! That you will support and defend the Constitution and the By 1987, nearly 60,000 Vietnamese refugees were calling Houston home. And most of those people were now Texans, certified American citizens who had pledged their allegiance to the United States of America. I don't know how to explain that feeling when the day I swear to be a citizen. I feel like here I am. Were you scared when you were escaping? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but I think after I leave it in Vietnam, maybe I have freedom, you know. So I am proud of the freedom, so I forget the scare, you know. Still, for the most part, Vietnamese refugees were proving themselves in nearly every area of American life. Students who knew no English arriving here were suddenly rising to the top of their class. Vietnamese newspapers, radio programs, and even television shows were popping up. And there were even jokes made about the number of Asians either working in or buying up convenience stores. No other group of immigrants has assimilated so fast mainstreaming into American life. 
I am a capitalist guy, you know, I like money, expensive cars, and big house, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the assimilation has not been without a price for the refugees. Many say they are starting to lose the most valuable thing they brought to this country, their sense of family. We live by the extended family, and uh, we think that the family is the basics of our society. We have to build up that kind of very close relationship in the family in order to have a strong society. Unfortunately, the strain of merging into American life pulled at the very fabric of the Vietnamese family structure, causing many traditional values to collapse. Women who stayed at home in Vietnam were suddenly thrust into the workplace, upsetting the dynamics of married life. For some, it ended in the unthinkable, divorce. Not many Vietnamese women then divorce in Vietnam. Very few, especially for Catholic. It was very hard for me. It took me many years to make the decisions. When the woman was young, when she stayed in the family, she has to obey the father. And when she get married, she has to obey the husband. And when the husband passed away, then she has to obey her son. It's a so, lifetime of obedience. Lifetime of obeying everyone. <laughs> The rules had changed by coming to America, and not just for married couples. Children who were brought up to obey and not question their elders were being encouraged to ask questions in school. Many were coming home and being forced to interpret for their parents in the community. Parents who were holding on to their Vietnamese customs felt their children were becoming foreigners, forgetting their Vietnamese heritage. The children go to school and speak English, pick up their of uh, the English language very, very fast. They come home and uh, they cannot communicate it easily with the grandparents. And so the grandparents resent it. They cannot be completely 100% Americanized because no matter how, even with plastic surgery, they cannot become 100% honest to goodness, red-blooded Americans. You see, they be still Vietnamese. I think that's, that's the immigrant's experience, is the terrible pull between wanting to make it in the, in the new country and wanting to hold on to the values of the old country. And there's a classic, classic uh, three-generational story experience in which the, the, the grandson remembers what the son tried to forget. The son, though, the son wants to become American? Yeah. The son tries very hard. Kids always, in every, wherever they are, try not to stand out, try to be like everybody else. It's one of the reasons why children learn new languages so rapidly, because they don't want to be different. While most Vietnamese quickly integrated into American life, some have not made the transition well. Community leaders say the first wave of immigrants from 1975 to 1980 were more educated than those who came later and were able to learn English and a trade faster than less educated refugees from rural areas. A report to Congress on refugee resettlement in 1985 showed that in 1976, more than 76 percent of Southeast Asian immigrants were able to find jobs. Those who arrived in 1982, however, had only a 25% employment rate. Many who are struggling stay in areas where little, if any, English is ever spoken, transposing their rural lifestyles to small plots of ground in front of public housing projects. The Allen Parkway Village housing project in Houston is scheduled to be torn down as soon as its residents move out into other projects around the city. Most have already left, but a core group of Vietnamese have refused to leave despite offers of better housing elsewhere. And yet many won't go. It's, you know, it's interesting. Many are elderly. Um, they've lived here a few years. They probably want to settle and stay in one place. There could be the problem of a culture barrier or a language barrier. Uh, once you get into a country and establish a little space, you probably want to hang on to that security. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to overcome that at some point. 
way the Vietnamese found they can hold on to their family structure is in business. By owning their own, they can employ the whole family, from grandparents to children, and keep the profits among themselves. Six ninety-six your king. Thank you, sir. The question they faced was where to get in the door. The answer for thousands in the Houston area was in the convenience store industry, not unlike the mom and pop operations at the turn of the century. I think um, almost Vietnamese family, they choose this kind of business because it's um, easy for them to make a living and they save money to uh, spend for their children to go to school. The whole family works in an operation like this? Yeah, almost Vietnamese uh, family work like this. So where did they get the money to buy something like this? Buying a business can't be cheap. Before they, um, they make this kind of business, they have to work outside and they save money together and they spend together and to build this kind of business. So the whole family then buys into the store? Yes. At the time, the uh, Vietnamese were migrating to this country. Inflation was high, uh, unemployment was uh, was uh, very low uh, and uh, uh, so we needed positions to be filled and they needed the job so it was if you pardon the pun a marriage of convenience uh. does your company worry at all that it may have trained its own competition uh, that that against the American way Jimmy and Finney Hua worked in retail outlets just long enough to take their experience and open a Vietnamese supermarket, the Hua Bin, which means peace in Vietnamese. Have you have your whole family helping? Yeah. The main thing is I have my whole, whole family help for me, so support me, so I, uh, I uh, don't worry about when I open the, my own business. So I always uh, told my uh, wife, the main thing, we are happy, not we are just uh, make the money a lot, but we are happy next our generation can uh, stand in the human right, you know. Uh, they can uh, do whatever they want. The success of the Kim San restaurant can only be called the success of a group effort. A popular downtown Houston lunch spot, the restaurant is run by the La family. In fact, some 20 members of the family work here, with others working at another Kim San restaurant on the west side of town. Manager Tree La says they've learned by sticking together they cannot be broken. His family has come a long way since arriving in the United States in 1980 with nothing. All of them came together on a boat. How many in all? 57 people. On a boat? In a boat. Now, how did you get out of Vietnam? Did you have to pay bribe money to leave? Yes, we had to pay uh, the, the money to the Vietnamese government. How much did it cost to leave? It cost about three or four thousand for each person at that time. And there were 57 of you? Yes. It must have taken your life savings to get out of there. Right. And that when we left Vietnam, we got nothing. Was it worth it? Yes. Because this is, uh, it's not like, you know, America is a land of, of opportunity. What about the shoes? Adopted oh. Rolls. <laughs> Rolls. They're not boots, they're shoes. Okay, and we forgot that he had a... Social service agencies identified the immediate needs of refugees to be a basic knowledge of English and a marketable trade. At the Houston Community College, classes are offered in welding, refrigeration, and basic mechanics. Now, loosen, loosen all the fittings. Okay, now, you are having to brush too flat. Okay. I want you to roll. Roll. First, the bristle is facing you. Yeah. Many women wow. choose cosmetology courses. Yeah. And then flare out. Okay. Not all the Vietnamese learn their trades here, though. Nearly 14% of the refugees held professional or managerial jobs in Vietnam. Another 43% were in sales or clerical work. Unfortunately, the jobs they were able to obtain in America were of lower status than the ones they held in their homeland. Less than half of Vietnam's white-collar workers made the transition. Let's see if you can open your eye for me.
Dr. James Cow was 28 years old and a practicing physician when he fled Vietnam. He had to undergo years of retraining in English to get his license here. His dream was to be an oncologist for his own people. How do you feel? What was it like for you setting up your own practice? Uh, uh, adventure. Once of my friends over this community told me that the Vietnamese people over here probably need some doctor that able to communicate in their own language. So for me, that is just like a dream, because I always dream to be uh, a doctor of my own people. It meant to me that you got to really uh, prove that you deserve something. That comes with the freedom. Yeah, it's always like that, you know. There's nothing, that's like they say, there's nothing free. And I got me a bad thing. And no matter what I did, I'm still an American citizen. I still got more rights in this country than any son of a bitch they can bring from Vietnam. 1981. Ku Klux Klan members were arriving in droves in the Texas Gulf Coast fishing community of Seabrook. Their arrival? A means of protesting the growing number of Vietnamese fishermen operating out of the Galveston Bay. The refugees had been moving into the area for several years and were starting to undercut American fishermen by working longer hours and selling their catch cheaper. Well, you know, when they first came there, they didn't meet with all that uh, hostility. The hostility only came later, you know, when these guys worked very hard. They got up early, and they got a bigger catch, of course. And then, then the, the locals started to see, hey, you know, he's trying to catch my fish. And that's when the hostility stopped. The hostility came to a head in Seabrook after an American fisherman farther south in the town of Seadrift was shot to death by a Vietnamese fisherman in what was ruled self-defense. Tensions had been flaring over what some called the suffocating work ethic of the refugees. The entire family would get up before dawn and fish day and night, keeping everything their nets caught. Locals complained the Vietnamese violated the customs of the sea and were gagging them economically, forcing them to live off a smaller portion of the pie. The film Alamo Bay portrayed the tensions this way. Reality, though, was far more frightening. Many shrimpers were carrying guns on their boats, Vietnamese boats were burned, and the white robes and flaming crosses of the KKK had many in law enforcement concerned about outbreaks of violence. At the time, Doi Do and her family had just moved to Seabrook and opened a fish market. Well, she was in the fish market with my brother when uh, a guy drove by in the truck, stopped by, get out of his truck, and waved his gun at us. You know, he didn't actually come in the store or anything. He just waved at us, like, trying to scare us, you know. Were you scared? Yeah, we were scared. She was scared, yes. And they threw things in the parking lot? Yeah, like um, beer bottles and stuff like that. You know, it was pretty bad then, but it's, it's calmed down right now. You know. Did you ever think about leaving? No, you know, because this is where the place we want to be at, you know, to make a living here. You know, just because they come by and scare us does not mean we have to move, you know, just because of them. We have to stand up for ourselves, too. You know, I can't just run away from, you know, just because they come by and threat us and stuff like that. There's no reason why we should be forced. We can't be the former Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, Gene Fisher, still says he was only trying to protect his livelihood. Today, Fisher makes his living off the land, not the sea, as a contractor. His former leader, Louis Beam, has been arrested, and another Klan leader has moved away from the area with a Mexican woman. But I was trying to, to stop something that this country was built on and based on, and it wasn't going to happen. It's not going to happen. And things just kind of escalated, maybe, uh, you know, more or less on their own, and with a lot of shove, uh, uh, from the media, uh, the, I think the media wanted, a, you know, it was almost like they, they were more bloodthirsty than I was. They wanted uh, 
a confrontation. Gene Fisher, when he was the, the Grand Dragon of the Klan one time, uh, he called me and, and told me that he had just contacted a, a media and told the reporter that he and 12 or 14 other fishermen had just got back from Camp Puller in uh, over in Anuak and had gone through basic training, the uh, paramilitary training that the Klan was supposed to be, you know, given to all the people. And I said, well, Gene, I don't, I, I saw you the other day, when did you get back? And he said, well, he, we never went. He said, but the point is, Kirby, he said, the media is my prostitute. And when I tell them we're doing something, they jump. You know, well, don't you think it. seeing the robes and the crosses kind of incites people? Oh, well, I know it does. Sure. But that wasn't the, you know, the primary purpose. The primary purpose was, was uh, to get the attention to tell our side of the story. To let people see that, you know, here was a, a, a fishing, two fishing villages side by side that at one time, at the most they ever had, was 70 boats here. Now, on a Sunday or whenever all the boats in port, you'll see in the area, I could estimate over, a, you know, 150 of just Vietnamese boats alone. Do you ever find yourself grudgingly respecting what these people have done? <laughs> no. What have they done? What have they done? How can you, you know, say, uh, do you respect uh, an army uh, of ants because they can devour a tree? Is that what you're <laughs> Sure, they've devoured a, a market and they will eventually cause themselves to go broke. I love my, my people. My people are all white. I love them above and beyond, or care about my race above and beyond anyone else's race. Doesn't mean I hate anyone else's race. What about the boat burnings? Well, at the time, like I said, it's too bad. It's not too bad that there was a boat burn, but too bad they didn't all burn. That doesn't disturb me one way or the other. You know, I was in it to, to win. I was blamed for it or blamed for ordering it. And I didn't order it one way or the other. But it's like I told a person from the FBI. I don't care if they all burn and take the captains with them, you know, and still don't care. If all of these boats here right now was to burn, it wouldn't bother me one, you know, one bit. Okay. So I'm not ashamed of anything I've done. Or the way I went about it might have been wrong. But you know, that's back there, you can't go back and change it. But I did do it. I didn't sit in a beer joint and talk about it. I didn't sit in a coffee shop and bitch about it. I went and tried to do something about it, tried to stop it. And now I have no regrets other than the losing. I don't have any guilt complexes, no guilt feelings about Vietnam or here. Are a lot of people bitter about the way things worked out? Oh, sure. Are you? Bitter? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who loses has got to be bitter, you know. That's the old thing about it. You just, as long as you play the game, everything is all right. That's a bunch of bull. People who grow accustomed to losing, that's what they are. There's right. losers. Today, the Seabrook area is quiet in part due to the efforts of the Justice Department. Efrain Martinez is a regional conciliator for the department, his job to come in and get both sides talking. He says what the area needed was time. As I uh, told uh, the parties involved, especially uh, the Vietnamese fishermen and the, uh, the Anglo fishermen, that really what we were trying to do is buy some time, that with the passage of time, the Vietnamese would get to learn the laws, the rules, the customs, get to know how things were done here, and then vice versa. The other side would get to know the Vietnamese better, get to understand them, and um, that essentially is what has happened. Still, local fishermen argue that the passage of time has only forced them out of business. It's just simple arithmetic, Ginger, if you... Uh... <clears throat> If you, there's about four 
uh, Indo Chinese fishermen to one American now. It's just about that odds. And, if, and if this is all coming just in the last few years, see? And if you put five times the doctors in Houston or five times the lawyers, their business would go to pot also, I would think, you know. Let's put it this way. We don't come here to try to run people or our business or the, uh, the natives our business or something. We just try to make a living and we work hard for that. We save our money. When we make it, we, when we earn the money, we save it. Not, not, not like the American people, you know, because they, they spend more than they earn, you see. That's the problem. The situation in Texas is quiet for now, but the problem is hardly over. In fact, as the refugees moved inland along the Gulf Coastal waterways and arrived in places like here at the mouth of the Mississippi River in southern Louisiana, the problems began all over again. Two men on a boat, and I had a boat stopped here. They had two men on a boat. I grabbed my shotgun. I never had no bullets for it. Two men on a That's like a man breaking in your house. You wake up and they got a man in your house. Two men in your house. You go for your gun, you know? Yeah. In September of 1987, 14 Vietnamese fishermen were arrested in Louisiana for allegedly opening fire on an American shrimper after their boats collided. At a preliminary hearing at the St. Bernard Parish Courthouse, charges of attempted murder were dropped against all but four of the fishermen. The Vietnamese claim shrimper Ricky Robin pulled a gun on them after his boat drifted into theirs. Yeah, I, I, they, they say that nobody on the control the, the American boat that's high. So, but the people on the, in the border and they go over there and tell them, your boat hit to my boat. But the American people say, oh, get out of my boat. They have the gun. They have the gun, the yeah, shotgun. They they gun. The, gun yeah. the fisherman's attorney claims it was a misunderstanding. There are some attempted murder charges here. That is correct. And there are still attempted murder charges against at least the four members of the crew of the two on. However, I do feel that uh, this is a tempest in a teapot, that my clients will be exonerated, and that there will be nothing further that will come of this. However, it is frightening to me to see the disputes between the Americans and the Vietnamese. Why does that frighten you? Because I've heard what happened in Houston. But the story Robin tells is far different. He claims he was trawling when he was hit by a Vietnamese fishing boat. He says he ran up front to find out what happened and found two Vietnamese men on his boat. Well, I wasn't scared until I seen them two Vietnamese on top of my cabin, mm -hmm. on my boat. What'd you think? I thought they was coming to get us, do something with us. So I ran and got my shotgun and uh, I couldn't find no bullets. So I went outside with it anyway. I ordered them off the boat. They jumped overboard and swam back to their boat. I looked around and, and my partner said, look, there's a boat. And I looked over there. They had another one. They had three boats coming to us, wide open. So I went in the front and I, with all excitement, I grabbed my trials and I tried to get away and I popped the key in the propeller and I was, I was stranded. I couldn't go ahead. I couldn't go back. And I was sitting there like a duck. And they came to the boat. We were scared to death. And I got on the radio, I started hollering the Coast Guard. I had got a hold of the Coast Guard and my wife. Then he just told me, stand by a minute. Some Vietnamese just hit my boat. He says, I can't move. He says, I have three of them coming toward me. He says, two of them just boarded the boat. He says, and, and I have no one around here to even help me. And just as soon as he told me that, then that's when his deck ain't come in the boat and started hollering, they shooting at us. They shot one shot. Then a second shot was fired when he dove in the cabin f with his face on a deck. I thought the ball was dead. I thought they shot it. But he had got up. He had dove and a shot come over him and hit the back of the cabin. Well, then the Vietnamese turned their lights off and they took off running. And, uh, and now you we had to get a tow in. And now you carry guns. Oh, yeah. We carry bullets, too. Plenty of bullets. We don't go out. We don't leave home without it. Robin's family and friends share his sentiments about the Vietnamese. The issues they raise sound identical to the ones Texas fishermen were grappling with six years ago. Issues involving customs and too many people fishing the same area. Meeting at his home, they spoke of their frustrations. They'll fish this area. When it's fishing its way down, a new state opens, they'll move on. And wherever they move on, they cause trouble and they don't know the rules of the sea. 
They got scouts. That's what they got. They got little scouts they send over here. And if we catch a shrimp over there, that little scout's going to radio to the fleet, and the fleet's going to come there and run you down. That's what's been happening. It's little scouts. They send one here, yeah. one over there, just like in the battle. <laughs> that's on, yeah. honest love, honestly yeah. true. That's honestly true. It's got little scouts. That is the truth. Do you know how locusts work? Locusts? Yes. Do you know how when they come into land, into cornfields, into any field, the locusts just eat and eat and eat, and it keeps, it keeps spreading and spreading and spreading, and when they leave that land, do you know what the land is good for? What? Nothing. That's just what it's going to happen. We outnumber two to one, three to one in our own waters. We don't stand a chance. They fish around the clock, day and night. They keep everything and anything. They live off the sea. You know, it used to be, when we used to go out in the shrimp boat, we couldn't look forward to leave the dock. All smiles to get out there. To, you know, we, we loved it so much. But lately, it got so bad that I'm just plain disgusted. And, 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 and to tell you the truth, if I could sell my boat, I would sell it. But who wants to buy it? Because they ain't going to be waiting on another couple of years. That's how bad it's gotten. In other words, I, I don't like shrimping no more. It's no more fun no more. It's serious. Whenever a man's got to carry a gun on it to make a living, it's got downright serious. It's disgusting. The Vietnamese are aware of the growing tensions in the Louisiana area, but like their counterparts in Texas, they too say they're only trying to make a living. Still, some say maybe the Vietnamese are working too hard and need to slow down. They work too hard, really. I saw some guy, they used go, you know, but three years, you know, about, I mean, 36 hours, they don't even sleep. That's the way they tie. You know, they keep going, going. And, you think they need to learn to slow down a little? Yes, I think so. How well authorities will be able to deal with the tensions between the fishermen remains to be seen. Locals say the government should step in and limit the number of licenses issued to commercial fishermen. But at this point, the government either can't or won't get involved. This has been disrupted, um, but um, you know, we cannot take them out. And as long as they're obeying the laws and um, going about their business, I am a capitalist guy, you know, I like money, expensive cars, and big house, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the American dream. <laughs> the American dream, yes. I think if I live in here for a while, I can do okay, and I will catch up everything in the United States. You feel you need to catch up then? Yeah, I need to catch up. That's a very long word. Spell it for me. D I C. Vietnamese children have done more than catch up in America's school system. Arriving in this country with little, if any, English, they've pushed themselves to the forefront of the public school system, in some cases leaving other students far behind. Asian ninth graders in the Houston Independent School District scored nearly 20 points higher on math tests than other students in 1987 and even outperformed the other students in spelling and basic language tests. I have seen a very dedicated student, a highly academic student, seriousness of purpose with goals and objectives. And they are good examples for students to follow. The thing that I notice most about them is that they seem to have a mission. I have to study for myself, you know. After I have a job, I can help them in, uh, because they are on the kinetic walk. They cannot go to work, and I have to help them. So when you get older, you plan on helping support your family? Yes. Many parents live only, and they put all their efforts into the children being able to be well-educated so they can have good jobs, high-paying jobs to uh, be able to grow in this society. And also to perpetuate the family. And as certainly, that's always, uh, when you're around a company, uh, country where majority of the people uh, are more than Buddhist, 
They come from a background where the family lineage is very, very important. So to have the children succeed is in a way guaranteeing the success of the family? That's correct. Do you ever wish that it would be okay to just get a B or a C once in a while? Mm, yes. Uh, I'm doing my best. The first time I make A's, B's, yeah, and C, you see, um, I think I did real good. Then I tried to do my best to make A's, all A's. And once you make all A's, you have to keep making all A's, mm -hmm. don't you? Is that hard? <laughs> yes. So you speak Vietnamese and English occasionally at home. You also speak Chinese sometimes at home. And you're studying Spanish here in school? Yes. <laughs> and my mom knows French. I also know a little because I study at Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, it sounds like the United Nations at your house. <laughs> I know. But the pressures to learn English and get good grades are not the only ones that Vietnamese kids are under. Many say they live a kind of schizophrenic existence, trying to exist between two worlds, their American world at school and their Vietnamese world at home. At home, we have to speak Vietnamese. We cannot speak English at home. <laughs> no, no. They're afraid that we for, we're going to forget how to speak Vietnamese. Vietnamese students at the University of Houston are no different. We do have conflict somewhere in there, and it's just like conflict, and um, it's just kind of different ideas, and it's like a democracy, and, and Democrat and a Republic, and want, want to move up, and want just like conservative holding back, and that's how I feel like Democrat, Democratic, but yet. It's Republican. <laughs> and you've got both parties inside you? Yeah. Do you think they're going to bring the same drive they have in the school system out into the real world? By all means, they will. Because they've already experienced some of the hardships. They've already experienced what it takes to be successful. They have worked hard, and they see that it will pay off if they work hard. And they will carry that same thing out into the marketplace. In other words, they probably will have in the back of my mind, I'm going to reach the top, catch me, which is good. And that's the old American way, competitiveness. First, I want to help my fellow man. Second, I want to make the most money I ever wanted. <laughs> <That's right>. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Third, you never want to get those two numbers mixed up. But not all of Vietnam's young people have become whiz kids. Many arrived here too young to learn a trade, but too old to learn enough English to go through a public school system. They fell through the cracks, and many turned to crime, preying on their own people. It's created several unique problems for police. How to combat the growing crime in the Vietnamese community, how to understand the refugees, and how to get them to report when a crime has been committed. In spite of the size of Houston's Vietnamese community, law enforcement officials admit they've not been able to effectively provide them with police services. Part of the problem is the language barrier. Only a few police can speak Vietnamese, and none of the city's 911 operators are trained in Asian languages. Perhaps at some point when the budget is better, the crisis team can uh, hire uh, Asian females to work in this capacity. At a meeting of Houston's Asian Task Force, local law enforcement agencies are working with the Justice Department and Vietnamese community leaders to find solutions to the growing problem of gang violence. You talk about losing face. I don't, I don't want to say about losing face, but I say about losing status. It's not just losing. Uh, the man was a boss, and over here, you know, it's third class. <laughs> In cities from coast to coast, police have found that getting Vietnamese people to report crime is a major stumbling block, in part because of the language barrier, but even more because of the refugees' reluctance to report crime at all. Asian investigators who work undercover in the Vietnamese community say there are many reasons for this. They're scared because in their country, the police over there were corrupt. And if they went to the police, the police would go and rob them, and what's ever left, then they would turn them over to the criminals also. So here, it, they just don't trust the police from their country. Is that hard for you? 
Yeah, it makes it very difficult for me. Uh, when I'm trying to talk to them, it's, uh, they just don't want to talk to you. A lot of times during the course of a robbery, when the uh, younger Asian females will be raped, they will report the robbery, but they will not report the sexual assault. Traditionally, it's a great shame for a girl to lose her, uh, you know, for a Vietnamese or an Asian girl to lose her virginity for one or to lose her pureness. Uh, so, uh, therefore, you know, rape is, is reported with great reluctance, if ever. So then the victim carries the shame for the crime? Of course, the victim carries the shame and... Uh, Isn't that a little backwards, though? Of course, it is very backwards. But uh, traditions are traditions, you know, we cannot change them overnight. Gang members know of the refugees' fear of police and prey on it, working almost exclusively in the Vietnamese community. Even though most gang members are in their teens or early 20s, police say they are dangerous and in some cases, deadly. They'll come into town here and they'll uh, get with some of these younger kids at some of these schools and get real close to them. And once they find out that mother and father or grandfather, whatever, owns a business, they'll find out about when they're bringing the money home, where they're leaving it, and then they'll go in and rob them. They uh, will tie them up, tape their mouths, uh, and put them in one room. And a lot of, also, when they do these robberies, they will wear a mask which makes it hard for the person to identify them. All of them are usually armed. Some of them with these uh, small type semi-automatic machine pistols, uh, Uzis, KG-99s, MAC-10s type weapons. Street police, like Officer Mike Kelly, say dealing with Vietnamese criminals is a whole new ball game for police since they operate differently than American criminals. Kelly works on the west side of Houston, where most of the city's Vietnamese community has settled. If you run into an Oriental burglar in your house or something, he may also be a top hitman. And this is, this is something else. That they don't specialize. See, they do it all. They'll destroy anything and anybody in the way, and they don't care. And it, they almost, they're proud of it. They're better armed. They're, they're carry, well, they tend to carry heavy armament, like submachine guns, which, of course, is not that difficult to get, considering their, all the military involvement in their past culture. There's a lot of that stuff floating around. We've gotten calls from California uh, with Texas plates showing up there with these gangster-type individuals in them, in the cars. So. Uh, they show their mobility from Texas to California or from Texas to, say, the northern states. Well, then, is the converse true? Have we had reports of California plates in Texas? We do get some... Uh, most of our plates are from California. Restaurants are a particularly easy target for the gangs. They don't have to search them out. Many stay open late. And members know restaurant owners don't want trouble. One gang call. A restaurant say, I need, uh, we need five, uh, five hundred dollars or something like that, and we'll pick it up uh, in 15 minutes. So the girl thought it was a joke. She thought nothing of it. And uh, 15 minutes, they did show up, seven of them. And uh, so she, you know, called 911 and went into the, you know, hiding into the bathroom. They pulled her out and made her open the, uh, the, the, the cash register and, um, you know, took her jewelry and so on and went. Before the police Before got the there? police came, yeah. Jim Ridgway is a social worker in the Houston area working for a Vietnamese-owned employment agency. He served for several years as a missionary in Vietnam. Now, as a member of Houston's Asian Task Force, he's trying to help police prevent crime in the Vietnamese community. Since most gang members are young and unemployed, he came up with a plan to help keep them off the streets. I call it a carrot and stick plan. I don't think they really <laughs> thought of it that way. but. The stick side was to find Vietnamese who were properly qualified to join the HPD Police Academy, graduate, and become officers on the street. The carrot side of the program was in being able to find jobs, just like we, we have here in this program, for the, 
the young singles and the adults, uh, just like anyone in the society. If you're not working, uh, times get tough, uh, you, you can get into trouble. Do you see the situation as getting any better or getting any worse? We see it uh, as kind of growing from year to year. Do you think these gang members are dangerous? For the type of uh, weaponry and the, the type of uh, modus operandi they use when they do these robberies, uh, the way they're described to us, I would, uh, I believe they, I'd use extremely dangerous. One way police have been able to get the word out to the Vietnamese on reporting crime has been through several local media serving the community. In Houston, there are nine Vietnamese newspapers, several publications, a radio program, and even a TV show targeting the Vietnamese audience. Lin Nguyen is the editor of one of the biggest Vietnamese newspapers in the Houston area. It's called Nai Ne, which means today in Vietnamese. Lin is more than a little experienced for the job, having been the former press secretary for the government of Vietnam. Every Vietnamese who is outside of Vietnam has relatives, some very direct relatives, some distant relatives, but we always have relatives and friends who are still back there. And we desperately need to know how everything affects them that are back there. What is it that the Vietnamese people want to read about? Well, they want to read by home first. News of Vietnam and news of the Vietnamese community around the world and uh, news of the Vietnamese community here in Houston. They also want to read uh, sort of like an explanation of what the other American news and world news mean to them as the Vietnamese community. Vẫn im hơi lặng tiếng. Không những thế, còn tiếp tục ca tụng những chính sách phản dân hại nước của đảng. The Voice of Free Vietnam also tries to keep the Vietnamese up to date. A weekly radio show started by Dr. Tin Tran in 1980, it provides the refugees with news, information on community activities, and where to get help if they need it. We use the, the Voice of Free Vietnam to make uh, people aware of different activities of the churches, like uh, the U.S. Catholic Charities, the YMCA Resettlement Program, uh, or uh, the uh, International Rescue, Rescue so Committee program. So you're getting the word out. Yes, we need to communicate. One of the more ambitious ventures for the Vietnamese has been the start of a weekly news and information television program. THVN is the brainchild of Quang Thanh, a former petroleum engineer who says he fell in love with television after taking a class in broadcasting. Complete with up-to-date equipment, some 25 Vietnamese young people pooled their talents to produce the show, which, like news operations everywhere, even has anchors struggling to get names right. Johnny Cleveland Hagen. Johnny Cleveland Hagen. Right. right. Okay. It's hard for me to. Okay. No. It's a variety show uh, for a half hour long every week, and uh, it has everything from information to entertainment to education. And the uh, main purpose is to uh, protect and develop our uh, culture and uh, help them to integrate into the American society. Because those people, they don't watch the local news very much, and they're not aware of what's going on, so... And this keeps people from living in their own world? That's right. For most Vietnamese refugees, the nightmare of leaving their homeland is far from over. Theirs is a culture that lives by the extended family, and nearly all the refugees who have settled in the United States had to leave someone behind. When the, uh, when the airplane took off, I realized that I lost my country. I realized that I lost my family. And I don't think that I would be able to ever see them again. That must have been so difficult it's, for you. It's very difficult for me. And I think it's very difficult for all the Vietnamese that who lost the country. So you lose uh family heirlooms, you lose 
family portraits. You lose your history. You lose your history. You are blank, blank, blank. The orderly departure program, set up as a safe and legal avenue for refugees leaving Vietnam, has turned into a bureaucratic and political maze of paperwork, even for people who are familiar with governmental systems. Houstonian Jerry Konisberg has been trying to bring over the parents of a young Vietnamese girl to the United States. She has written to dozens of officials in Washington for help and has even flown to the Vietnamese embassy in London to ask officials there to allow the parents to come to the United States. Her experience has been a kind of catch-22. The Vietnamese say they will let the parents out if the U.S. gives them an entry permit. The U.S. says they will give them an entry permit if Vietnam gives them an exit permit first. She's got a disease that is attacking, attacked her hearing and is now attacking her sight so that she will fairly soon be blind. The State Department was real helpful, uh, not on a, an official basis though, but people within the State Department was giving me names of mercenaries who, go, who supposedly go into Vietnam and can get people out. But I have some real concerns about working with, you know, those kinds of Rambo type people. Um, there's no guarantee that the family would get out safely I don't have an endless supply of money, and some of the people, Vietnamese and American types, mercenaries, have asked for substantial amounts of money. How much? Uh, anywhere from twenty thousand to five hundred thousand dollars, and with no guarantee. What if she went back? She can go back. Um, the Vietnamese mission office in New York told me that she can, in fact, go back, but she would probably be killed or put in jail because, as a boat person, they would consider her a traitor. At nine years old? At nine years old. For refugees unfamiliar with the system, waiting for reunification can take years. Michael Wynn is 62 years old. He worked as an accountant for the U.S. government for 13 years in Vietnam, but was left behind when the Americans evacuated. If I stay there, one time, they, someone, knew me that time they put me in jail uh, with a cord or uh, a big stone and they put me on the river and no more me no more uh, on the life you think they would have killed you that's right but in Vietnam, michael left his family and moved from village to village for five years before crossing the border into thailand by bicycle he arrived in the United States in 1981 and has been trying since then to bring his wife and daughter to Houston. He thought between his status as a former employee of the U.S. government and his new status as a citizen, they would be reunited quickly. But after an arduous letter-writing campaign to officials in Washington and seven years, he is still waiting. Come on in, Mike. How did you do this? Fine. Come okay. on in. Good. See you. Michael has taken his down? case to Congressman yes, Jack Fields. You much, You're welcome. Please sit down. Thank you. Hoping for help. Uh, I'm sure she's told you that we've written several letters to the U.S. Embassy. And, you know, we're going to be following this very closely and uh, trying to encourage the government of Vietnam to allow, you know, your wife and your, and your daughter to come out and... Um, you know, we'll just have to stay vigilant and continue to work on it. And Thank so we're going to do everything we possibly do can. Do you think many of these people are simply victims of international politics then? I think many of the refugees that have not been reunited are, in essence, pawns in a, uh, a major propaganda game on the world stage between the governments of Vietnam and the, and the government uh, of the United States. And these people are actually in the middle. And, uh, you know, it is my concern that perhaps the people who are still in Vietnam are pawns uh, being used by the government of Vietnam to exact certain uh, treatments from the United States. Realistically, though, what are Mike's chances of being reunited with his family? I can't say that because the government of Vietnam does not necessarily have a definite procedure or definite regulations. Uh, for 18 months, they suspended exit visas altogether. One of the saddest aspects of this entire story uh, is that there is uncertainty. I cannot say to Mike or to anyone else who wants to be reunited with family in Vietnam uh, that that will 
ever materialize. I know that I'm freedom and we're happy. Okay, I'm free, but no family here, but always a wife and daughter make me sad. Yeah, I, I wish one, one day, maybe soon in the future, they come here with me, and that's all. And that time I, I don't need to know anything else. Maybe I work, work, work very hard, but I don't care. I want them to come here with me only. Because of us, six and a half years ago, I feel very sad that no any day, only whole day, I feel happy. Maybe a couple hours, that's all. No more. No whole day, I feel happy. They are now our new Americans, strange people from a strange land who landed on our shores hoping for another chance at the freedom they lost. It has brought out the best and worst in us and in them. And in the process, they have learned that freedom also means freedom to fail. Their hopes lie always in their next generation, a generation of Vietnamese who will be made in America. I want to graduate from university and uh, I work for myself and maybe in the future I want to have my own business. We do have a dream and it's not only American dream, we do have a dream that we'll come back to our country and that's the only thing that when I come back I hope I can achieve something and be proud of to help the people in Vietnam. That's been the story of America. It, always immigrants have brought in the kind of energy, the commitment. They become more American than Americans, more aware of the richness and the freedom and the opportunities that this country represents. Every time a new, a new family comes to this country seeking the hope and opportunity the country provides, it's, it ennobles the American spirit. It reminds us of what we're about. I got the biggest kick when I first moved here and I saw this, this, this oriental family with these little kids walking around and I, I expected to hear some foreign language come out of these kids. He said, hey mama, can we get a hamburger? Yeah. <laughs> little oriental kids with a Texan accent. With the two cowboys, have to work to the Little cowboy can help the big cowboy. That's the two cowboy. Here, the two work. Two, the little cowboy can help the big cowboy. <laughs> For information on videotapes and transcripts of Made in America, write KUHT Production, 4513 Cullen Boulevard, Houston, Texas, 77004.